Hey, 42 here. I think we can all agree that dogs are amazing creatures. Smart, loving and loyal. There's a reason we consider canines, not chickens, to be man's best friend. And if there's a lesson to learn from watching Glassy, other than the fact that some humans can understand how yet another bastard bark translates to Timmy's trapped in a mine, it's that dogs are also brave. Oh, and as an interesting Mandela effect aside, not once in 571 episodes did Timmy ever get trapped down a well. Anyway, it stands to reason that the accolade of bravest dog in history is hotly contested. Despite many contenders for this coveted canine crown, one dog climbed head and shoulders above the rest. Do dogs have shoulders? Can we check that? During the darkest days in modern history, this was a dog who led from the front, fighting for his country whilst most dogs were content to cowardly stay at home asleep in their baskets. Which is fair enough, I guess. They were dogs after all. Meanwhile, this proud pooch served in 17 battles, was given his own rank in the army, and even long after he passed, is still seen by millions of people every year. I know that last bit sounds strange, but trust me. Say hello to Sergeant Stubby, the most decorated dog of the First World War and an inspiration to humans and animals alike. Now let's take a minute to talk about hair loss because I've had people close to me start to lose their hair as early as their 20s, and it's always been an upsetting experience. If you're in the same boat, then you're not alone. Did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative now and do something about it whilst you've still got hair left. I like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication every three months. So you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. There's a reason that Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. And hundreds of thousands of men trust them for their hair loss prevention medication. So if you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose your hair just yet. But prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you'll see results. And the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. If you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com 42 or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video. The phenomenon of animals in action is nothing new. If you went back 2,000 years, you'd witness war elephants wreaking havoc on ancient battlefields. And since then, several species have served their masters in a skirmish, from camels and pigeons to rats and dolphins. There's been a veritable Noah's Ark of beasts in battle. Naturally, dogs have featured most prominently over time because of their intelligence, temperament, and proclivity to obey. The Romans trained dogs to fight by their side, and you might remember the opening battle scene in Gladiator, where Russell Crowe's four-legged friend fights off his foes. In the Middle Ages, hunting dogs like Mastiffs were sent into battle to topple knights from their horses, and both Attila the Hun and Napoleon counted dogs amongst their forces. In the Boer War, several dogs earned medals after serving British regiments in South Africa. So, by the time the First World War broke in 1914, there was already a long tradition of dogs in duty. Little is known about Stubby's early years. The plucky five-year-old Boston Terrier was first found roaming the grounds of Yale University in July 1917. At the time, the 102nd Infantry, 26th Division, was based at the Yale Bowl, the university's football stadium, and Stubby would hang around as they trained. One soldier in particular took a shine to this errant mutt, a private by the name of James Conroy, and he named him Stubby because of his short tail. The dogs, that is, not Conroy's. The newly christened Stubby appeared made for life in the military, and he practiced the required drills and bugle calls along with the other soldiers. The camp rules forbade animals, but Stubby had such a positive effect on morale that the rules were swayed. He even learned how to do a little doggy salute, raising his right paw to his eyebrow on command. 
After three months of training, the 26th Division were deployed to the front line in France. Now Conroy had a dilemma, since he wasn't technically allowed to bring his new best mate along. But, as he saw it, leaving him on campus was just plain wrong. So, when the regiment rode the train to a Virginia port, Stubby joined them. From there, Conroy smuggled Stubby aboard the SS Minnesota by hiding him under his greatcoat. Thankfully, Stubby was a tiny terrier, not a great day. Once on board, Conroy concealed Stubby in a coal bin, which is a humiliating way for anyone to travel transatlantic, especially a future war hero. Mid-journey, Stubby's destiny turns dicey when he was discovered by an officer. Legend has it, the Hound won the gentleman round by doing his patented salute. Charmed by his doggy deference, it was decided he could stay. Free from his hideaway, he roamed the ship as the crew grew fond of this superstar stowaway. He was so endearing that a machinist made him a set of literal dog tags, and the 122nd Division declared him as their unofficial mascot. The SS Minnesota landed at saint Nazaire on the western coast of France. Shortly after, the troops, plus one pooch, travelled to the Western Front, a 400-mile stretch of trenches bordering France and Belgium. At first, Stubby had no official role, but joined Conroy in his various duties, occasionally accompanying him on horseback as he ferried messages to various command posts. But it was in February 1918 that Stubby truly turned into a dog of war. On St. Patrick's Day, the front line where he and his master were bunkered came under intense bombardment from Germans who shelled it non-stop for 24 hours. Soon after, Stubby was exposed to toxic gas and had to be taken to a field hospital and nursed back to health. But this incident imbued him with a canine superpower. From then on, his nose was highly sensitive to any traces of gas hopefully excluding any that came from his own ass. Using his newly found olfactory excellence, Stubby soon committed his first truly heroic act. Early one morning, the Germans launched a gas attack, and Stubby smelt it long before his human companions even knew who dealt it. He proceeded to dash up and down the trench, barking and nipping at the soldiers to wake them and ushered them to safety. For his bravery, Stubby was made a private first class. Oh, and if you were concerned for Stubby's safety during his gas detection duties, fear not. His comrades had fashioned him a custom gas mask. By now, Stubby drew a distinctive figure, sporting a specially made chamois coat, reportedly given to him by admiring local women. It was embroidered with his name and became home to his ever-growing collection of medals. One commendable consignment of Stubby's was seeking out wounded soldiers in no man's land. He would pinpoint his allies in need by listening out for English speech. Then he'd bound over and stand by them, barking to alert the paramedics. Once back in the dugout, Stubby sat beside the wounded men, keeping them company, and he remained awake if they fell asleep, to ensure they were safe. Sadly, Stubby sustained a war wound during an especially fierce German attack when shrapnel hit him in his leg and chest. But you can't keep a good dog down and after a couple of months of rest, he was back doing what he did best, putting the fear of God, or should that be dog, into the enemy. By now, he was able to identify Germans and Americans by their uniforms. Khaki meant good, and grey meant bad. One day, he spotted a German spy hiding in some bushes, seemingly trying to map out the Allied trenches. Well, not on Stubby's watch. He charged the insurgent, sinking his teeth in and holding on until the cavalry arrived. Well, infantry in this case. For this courageous act, Stubby was made a sergeant. As a bonus, an iron cross was lifted from the captured German and placed on Stubby's coat for him to keep. Stubby's dislike of the Second Reich was so strong that when prisoners of war were brought back to camp, he had to be tied up so he didn't further add to their woes by gnawing at their toes. Stubby remained at the heart of the action until the war ended in November 1918. By then, 
the 102nd had seen more fighting than any other American infantry, 210 days in total. To say they must have been dog tired is putting it mildly. When his unit relocated to Paris, Stubby was purportedly recognised by hundreds of American, Australian, French and English troops eager to shake his paw. And he even led a victory parade in the city to much hurrah. Then on Christmas Day, he met President Woodrow Wilson, the first of three he would encounter. Stubby promptly presented his paw to the POTUS for a shake. Apparently, the formality of his usual salute went out the window when he was meeting ward leaders. Bit rude. In April of 1919, Stubby and Conroy were officially demobilised back in Massachusetts. But whilst the war was over, for Stubby, things were just getting started. He'd arrived in France in 1917, an anonymous animal. And he returned a year later, a canine superstar. He was like Scooby-Doo but a really brave Scooby-Doo that could sniff out gas and wasn't weirdly obsessed with snacks. He travelled across America to veterans commemorations and was hounded by the paparazzi. Or should that be paparazzi? Sorry, I'll stop now. Our much lauded mongrel even became a vaudeville star, performing in theatres owned by the biggest impresario of the day, the wonderfully named Sylvester Z. Polly. And he once appeared on stage with the so-called Queen of Movies, Mary Pickford, the most famous actress of the age. Stubby was now the most celebrated animal in America, and there was no end in sight for his ever greater escapades. In 1920, he appeared at the Republican National Convention. Then, in 1921, he was awarded a gold medal at the White House by General John Pershing, the highest ranking officer in the US Army. That same year, James Conroy, remember him, Stubby's owner, the guy with the big coat, yeah, moved to Washington to study law at the prestigious Georgetown University. Never one to simply sit about, Stubby became the university's sports mascot. During football games at half-time, he'd keep the crowds in thralls by playing with the ball. When not kipping at the university, he enjoyed many alternative accommodations. The Majestic Hotel in New York, one of the finest of the era, built by Jacob Rothschild in Central Park, broke its no-dogs policy and allowed Stubby to stay the night. I dread to think what was on the room service bill the following morning. Oh, he was also made a lifetime member of the YMCA, which, as we all know, is a fun place to stay. And they promised him free bones a day and a place to sleep whenever he wanted. Stubby enjoyed his celebrity lifestyle of parades, pictures and plentiful bone picnics for many years. He lived until the ripe old age of 13, dying peacefully in his sleep in 1926 and received a full-length obituary in the New York Times that opened simply and powerfully, Stubby is dead. But good old Stubby continued to serve his country even after death. He was taxidermied, replete in his trademark coat and medals, and placed in the Smithsonian Museum, where he remains to this day. Every year, millions of visitors have the chance to see Stubby as part of an exhibition on the Great War. And it's nice to know that over 100 years since his brilliant bravery on the battlefield, the world is still celebrating the dog whose bite was every bit as bad as his bark. Oh, and it's been confirmed, dogs do have shoulders. Good to know. And thanks for watching.